I just removed all this wiring from this Jeep and it works way better now. If you stick around, I'll show you how I did it. Now I have been driving this Jeep for a while and it uh, starts and stops and charges and all that good stuff. But I haven't actually really done much wiring. Uh, most of the wiring looks like this. Luckily, these Jeeps are incredibly simple. Really to run it, you only need four wires. And um, this stuff is just for fancy things like lights and such. But seeing how we're getting fancy here, I'm gonna go ahead and hook up the lights and such. Here's all you need to actually run one of these Jeeps. Obviously you need a big positive and a big negative from the battery. This one goes to the starter switch. Now these Jeeps have an inline starter switch right on the uh, positive cable. So no solenoid wire needing at all. It's pure mechanical. The negative goes right to the block. Then I have a uh, ignition output and this is the alternator in. Now since I have a one wire alternator, that alternator in goes straight from the alternator right to the battery. That's it. The ignition wire goes straight from the ignition. I actually have it run into the interior to a switch and comes right back to the positive terminal of the coil. That wire there, you don't actually even need. That is for my voltmeter and it's not necessary to drive. So that's the only one you need. Then there is a wire going from the coil to the distributor. That's all I got. That's all that runs this entire vehicle right now. Everything else looks like this. So, um, we're gonna do something about that. Now I've decided not to try to go completely stock with this vehicle. Um, basically I wanna keep the stock flavor, the stock idea, but if modern stuff works better, I'm going with the modern stuff, like uh, modern tires and uh, a 12 volt electrical system. Uh, that definitely works better. And I already have a Chevy alternator on there. It puts out 12 volts. That alternator works better than generators ever did. But I'm going to go ahead and make this thing fully functional at this point, which means I need things like taillights and headlights. So uh, I'm going to work on that next. All right, now under the hood, take a look at the factory wiring, see what I can reuse. I've got lots of electrical tape going down there. Um, some wires that are a bit frayed. Uh, those, I don't know, might be okay. Uh, a few more frayed sections. Oh, here's some this bare wire sticking out. Uh, we've got some random bits that go somewhere, but they're not attached. Um, we've got connectors not connected, more electrical tape, um, bare wire sticking out, wire all the way through its insulation, and that insulation just flakes right off. So, um, yeah. This is, this is probably, I'm probably not going to be reusing this wiring. So apparently today we are wiring a complete Jeep end to end, replacing every single bit of wire, except the positive and negative from the battery and maybe the alternator wire, because I just put those in recently. Other than that, we're redoing it all. Some of these bolts um, just don't want to cooperate. It's like they've been in place for over 70 years. There cooperation. We're getting somewhere. I'm really glad I pulled out all this wiring completely because uh, we had the stuff that I'd seen and then as I got under it there's melted wires. Here I have a wire that's not bad. Electrical tape going to completely bare wire going to more electrical tape going to wire that looks okay. So either end looked okay but the middle was terrible. So if I had used this, it might have looked decent, but uh, still been a problem. This whole section is totally melted on me. Burned through, it had a nice covering on it, but maybe it laid on the exhaust? Something like that. That definitely would have been a problem. I'm not even sure what's going on here. It's all electrical taped up and melted and squished and completely rigid. So uh, that was bad. I was working on these headlights here um, it actually looks like the wire gets pretty decent. 
Uh, it was inside some kind of a uh, loom sheath kind of thing. Um, it's a fabric enclosure and that seemed to have protected it from being too bad. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to trim these up until I get to good solid wire and use the pigtails of the connectors and the headlights and all that. That way I don't need to take the headlights out. But I do need to figure out which wires go to what. Uh, there's going to be a high and a low beam. There's basically two wires going to each headlight. One's high, one's low. And um, I'm just going to put power to them and see what happens. I'm using my meter on the 10 amp setting to hook power to this because uh, it'll act like a jumper wire and then I'll know how much power it draws so I know how much I need to put into it. So, let's see, we've got a light that is a little under 3 amps. Uh, another beam, that one is uh, four and a half amps. So that must be high beam, so I'm just going to point the wire up higher. Now the other side, I'm getting nothing. So we probably have a burned out filament. Uh, let's try the next one. Eight, we got eight amps. So that is probably the high beam on that side. And the wire's getting hot. All right, so uh, now I know. Now I pulled out my high and low beam switch to test it out and it was easier to remove that way. Now these are basically a real simple switch. You can see there it has a label, hopefully you can see it. It says battery. So this one here is your power in, goes to the battery. And then you're gonna have one out and then another out. One's gonna be high, one's gonna be low. So uh, when you push the switch, it switches which output you have. So let's test this thing here. So right now, I'm connected to this middle pole, not connected to this end one. Flip the switch, not connected to the middle, but connected to the end. So all I have to do is hook up my both beams from one to one of these, both beams from the other to the other one, and I got my high and low beam switch in the factory location. Well, I went ahead and replaced that headlight, and I'm glad I did. Because come to find out, that 8 amp reading I was getting was actually the low beam. Uh, the high beam would actually have been higher. I went and scavenged the light from another Jeep, and uh, while I was doing it, I was thinking, these originally came with 6 volts. That light might have actually been an original 6 volt light that was in there, and uh, that's why I was drawing so much amperage. Because for the same amount of power, uh, you actually have to use twice as much amps so a 6-volt system with 8 amps going to the headlights would be the same amount of power output as a 12-volt system with a 4 amps going to the headlight. So uh, I very well could have had a 6-volt uh, headlight in there and uh, just not known it. This one for sure is a 12-volt, so I'm good there. I checked the amperage. It's only drawing 4 amps on high beam. So uh, between the two, I'm less than 10 amps for uh, running both high beams, or should be. Go check that right now. Got my amp meter hooked up and both headlights are wired together to the high beam side. And yep, 7.8 amps. And we've got two high beams. So we're in good shape here. Now I know I need even less power to run the headlights. Still probably gonna go a 20 amp switch, put like a 15 amp fuse in it, which should be good. So uh gonna wire these things up. Now I only have one spool of heavy gauge wire that's good enough for these headlights. Uh, it's 12 gauge, that should be fine. Uh, but it's all one color. So I'm wiring three wires into the switch, all the same color wire. When you do that, put little bands of colored electrical tape around these ends, and then corresponding bands on the other ends. That way, uh, when you have all three in the same bundle, you can tell which is which at the end because it has a little stripe on it. I've been having good luck with these solder and seal connectors, so I'm going to use one of these. Slide this one in, and then just heat gun to solder it and seal it up. And you keep going until you see solder start flowing inside there. Seems like it's too hot, but so far the plastic is held up. All right, I'm going to hold it in position while it cools, and uh, it should be good. Now I've got a bunch of holes cut here in the firewall. I'm guessing someone had some sort of heater hacked in there. Probably a couple different versions, and they kept cutting new holes. 
So I'm gonna cover them up with a fuse panel. Uh, this is just a generic, uh, what is it, 10 circuit panel where I can have power in, a bunch of fused outputs. And I'm just gonna uh, screw that right to the firewall here, cover up a bunch of those holes. So two birds with one stone. Good old self-tapping screws will make this easy. There we are. All right, now I've got to get power to that fuse box. Uh, there is a wire coming off the battery on this um, positive terminal, which I could take power from that, but this one's not quite long enough anyway, so I'll probably replace that eventually. I'm not sure I'll get another one with one of these because they're usually more expensive. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to take power from the alternator. So I made up a thick jumper wire, and this is not going to be fused, so this wire um, it's thicker than I need. The insulation is really thick, which is why I like it for an unfused application. And I had a bunch lying around, so it was free. You have both of these on the alternator terminal, so it's gonna take power from there and go straight to the fuse box. Now I have heard that this can cause radio interference by taking power from the alternator, not from the battery directly, but I don't have a radio, so I don't care. Whenever I dismantle a car, I sort all the parts I can use out of it. So I've got stacks of fuses. We're gonna go, let's say 15 amp for this one. I didn't have a switch for the lights in my spare switches bin. So I went to the store, I actually bought a switch, is a push-pull one and rated for 20 amps. So it'll act like the original style switch where you pull it out, turn on the lights and plenty of current capability. So, uh, perfect. All right, let's try it out. Switch is on. There we go. Now before I finally install this headlight switch, I got one more wire to add to it. On the output side, when it turns on uh, and gives power, I'm gonna add this string of uh, spade connectors because these gauges have lights with a spade connector on them. So I'm gonna have wire that comes from the uh, switch and goes to every single connector on the back of each gauge and that way, when I turn my headlights on, I should have interior lights. Or at least I can see the gauges. I actually looked at where I was going to run it behind the dash and ran it outside. So I have more of my switches, I'm going to go over the choke cable, and then I kind of figured out where the spacing of each gauge was. Give myself a little extra room to wiggle with. Let's see what we got. We got gauges, we got headlights, high beam, Low beam, and that's it. We have achieved lights. I'm working on the ignition wires and getting the stuff in the uh, engine bay here done. I've got a few loose wires that I want to tuck up under this rail here. Well, I'll show you a quick and easy and cheap way to do that. What I'm going to do is take an old piece of fuel line, chop off a little bit of it, and then take that and chop down the length of it. So now we can put our wires inside this uh, rubber tubing. They make split loom that you can buy, but I have lots of fuel line lying around, so I might as well use it. I'm gonna go with a zip tie. I got the fashionable color coordinated red zip ties here, because I had a big assortment and might as well pick the one that matches. So line up our tubing in place. And I just drilled a hole in this flange to run the zip tie through. It's just basically big enough to put the zip tie around it. Snip it off with your favorite zip tie tool. And uh, now you have wires. You can actually run more wires in and out of this if needed. Uh, you just have to run them through. Or if the zip ties are cheap, just replace that. But that keeps it up and out of the way and keeps it from rubbing on anything. So I'm going to do a couple of those along here. And I uh, should button this up. Now the old harness on this side had some real nice metal clips. So I'm going to steal those and reuse them. And uh, with these, you can use the same trick as before, piece of rubber tubing. All right, so then we have the tubing in. I'm gonna slide the clip over the tubing. It's a little bit of a tight fit, but it'll work. And then I have some bolts that are way too long, but they're the only ones at the right diameter. We'll pop those through the clip, and then on the outside, there. Now we got nice secure mounting. I think I got one more, so I'll do one more along this fender and right at the end here. And uh, that all should be secure. 
And if I need to, I can just unbolt those and slide more wires through, because eventually I'll probably add a lot more stuff to this Jeep. Right now, it's the basics. Last thing I gotta do is the tail lights. Now, this is a simple two filament light. There's gonna be one low beam that's gonna be used for running lights, and one high beam that's gonna be used for brake lights. That's just like a simple trailer light, uh, real basic. And I happen to have a box full of spare trailer wiring. So I'm gonna go with the same color code that the trailers use. We've got brown is running lights, green is the uh, high beam on the right side, yellow is the high beam on the left side, and white is ground. Uh, I've got Cassie ground here, so I don't need the white. So I have a couple of rolls. This one's brown and green, this one's brown and yellow, and uh, I'm just gonna attach them to the appropriate tail light and run it forward. Now for the tail lights, I already have switched power from the headlight switch going to the high and low beam switch. That's right near the frame. So all I did was attach the um, low beam on the tail lights to the input on that switch. So as soon as the wire goes on for the headlights, the tail lights go on. And I didn't have to run the wiring up to the dash. I just ran it right here to the floor. Now the brake light wiring is pretty easy. What we have here is a pressure switch right on the end of the master cylinder. You basically run power to it and then your lights go out. So basically as soon as you have pressure on the brakes, the power connects to the lights and they turn on. These lights should be wired, um, but I can't see them when I hit the brake pedal. So I'm gonna go hit the brake pedal and keep an eye out and see if these go off. So we have tail lights. Did it work? And that's it. That's all I actually need to do. Um, at this point, uh, this vehicle is road legal and fully functional. I got brake lights so no one rear ends me. I've got headlights so I can see where I'm going. I can even see my gauges at night. Now, you may have noticed I didn't do turn signals, and that is because this vehicle didn't have turn signals originally. This is what a CJ2A originally looked like. One tail light, and that's it. Nothing on the other side, no signal lights. And I've actually looked this up before. Uh, basically, if your vehicle didn't come with it, you don't have to have them. So I'm totally road legal without turn signals because it didn't have them originally. Now I eventually will add signal lights. I do have a clamp on turn signal switch that goes on the column uh, somewhere. Not sure where exactly. When I find it, I'll install it. Uh, but somewhere in my piles of stuff, I know I have one. So there will be still more upgrades, but this is the basics. We have complete new wiring, except for the couple wires that went to the headlights that look good. Everything is brand new and uh, totally functional. So uh, I'm happy with the progress on this. So I'm calling this a success and I'll move on to something else. And uh, keep having fun. Hope you're having fun too. We'll see you next time.